Ten. Hey, I'm going to take my mute. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today's fantastic webinar, Turkish Association for Seismic Isolation webinar. My name is Mehmet Emre Özcanlı. I am the president of TASI. In TASI webinar series, worldwide reputed seismic isolation experts present on seismic isolation applications in their countries. Today, Mr. Aaron Malatesta is presenting seismic design with viscous dampers, applications and design strategies from Taylor Devices Incorporation USA. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in our TASI YouTube channel, chat panel. I'll bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions at the end. Especially, I would like to thank Mr. Paolo Clemente, who is ASIC president, as he distributed our webinar announcement to all ASIC members throughout the world. I would like to mention uh, shortly synopsis of the webinar today. Structural engineers have been using Taylor devices, viscous dampers to protect new and existing building structures from seismic excitation for over 25 years. There are a number of different types of damping applications and the primary objective of this presentation will be to demonstrate the basic princi principles for retrofit of non-ductile concrete buildings with and without weak first floor levels. The presentation will include an overview of uh, preliminary design concepts, simplified design procedures, viscous damper modeling, as well as post-processing of results. Several examples will be presented and alternative methods for construction detailing will be discussed. I would like to introduce our speaker today briefly. Mr. Aaron Malatesta, is a professional engineer and is a director of structural engineering services at Taylor Devices. Mr. Maratesta graduated from Stanford University with a master's degree in structural engineering. Before joining Taylor Devices, he practiced structural engineering for consulting firms focused on both buildings and transportation infrastructure. As a licensed professional engineer in the state of California, he has been involved in the design and retrofit of a number of different types of structures. His current tasks at Taylor Devices include leading development of technical publications, management of research and development activities, and working with engineers to improve the performance of structure using viscous damping systems. He is actively involved in ASCII 7 and ASCII 41 committees for seismic isolation systems, and energy dissipation devices. Now I would like to give the stage to Mr. Aaron Malatesta. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, it's an absolute honor to present to you all today. Um, and, and thank you for coordinating this effort, my man. Um, with respect to Taylor Devices, Taylor Devices, it's not just me preparing this presentation on my own. Um, Nathan Canny, our, our senior project manager, and, and Conrad Erickson, our seismic product sales director, have been especially helpful as well, as, as, as well as many of the other members from Taylor Devices. So as uh, Mehmet said, today I'll be presenting on seismic design with viscous dampers, applications and design strategies. Um, I am based out of Long Beach, California, um, as Mehmet said, so I'm a structural engineer and, and I've got my degree here in California, so very familiar with, uh, with earthquakes. Um, a brief presentation outline, um, we're going to give a quick overview of the background of Taylor devices, um, a general discussion on why to use viscous damping, the applications to building structures, how dampers themselves function, how to model them, uh, and then we'll do a quick seismic design overview for, for non-ductile concrete uh, moment frames with and without soft or, or weak stories. Um, so Taylor Devices was founded in 1955 by Paul Taylor. Um, the company is based near Buffalo, New York um, on an island in, in, in a city called North Tonawanda. You can see here the red dot where Taylor Devices is actually located is in the middle of the Niagara River in between Niagara Falls uh, and, and, and downtown Buffalo. Uh, 
originally the company was developed to support the aerospace and military industry. And it wasn't until the 1990s that tailored devices began providing their products to the construction industry. Uh, our standard products for the construction industry are, are number one, viscous dampers, but we also provide lockup devices and custom devices as well to meet structural engineers' exact specifications for very custom requirements. What we can do as a company, we, we can provide structural design support. So if you're looking at a design from it's either concept level, design development, or construction documentation, we want to provide you the support you need to be able to understand how to use viscous dampers and, and, and how to document them in your construction drawings as well as installing them. Um, we, we, we also can manufacture and, and design custom devices um, as well as we have tools for machining and, and, and all of our devices are tested with hydraulic uh, actuators. Taylor Devices Worldwide has provided a majority of our projects for the United States of America, but kind of the runner-up countries would be Taiwan, China, Japan, and South Korea. We have over 750 projects in over 35 countries, and more than 30,000 dampers have been installed. About 75% of the projects are building projects, whereas the other 25% are, are bridges. Uh, we provide dampers up to 8,000 kilonewtons um, with strokes up to uh, around a meter. A quick breakdown on the left shows what the applications for viscous dampers are in the US. Uh, about 50% of the work that we do in the US are for seismic retrofit of buildings and bridges, the majority being buildings. About 25% of the work that we do are providing viscous dampers for uh, new construction uh, with a pretty even spread between new steel moment frames in parallel with base isolation systems or on bridges. And the other 25% of the work that we do is providing viscous dampers for miscellaneous applications that may not be seismic, they may be some other sort of vibration, or maybe it's just a unique application. In Turkey, on the right here, um, we've done projects for retrofit of buildings, new construction of buildings, and, and, and seismic retrofit of bridges. Right now, we're gonna discuss these damper applications a little bit further. So I would like to kind of describe why do we use viscous damping? And so viscous damping, what it is in a general sense, it absorbs kinetic energy and it can be used to protect structures by reducing dynamic amplification of motion caused by hazardous vibrations. And whether those hazardous vibrations are pedestrians walking across a bridge like shown here at the Millennium Bridge in London, or high-speed trains moving across an aerial viaduct, or extremely tall building with wind vibrations from a design windstorm, or comfort levels, or shock vibrations uh, from uh, of some sort. But last but not least would be would be earthquake uh, vibrations, and that's what we'll spend the majority of our time talking about today. Um, we're all very familiar as, as structural engineers uh, looking at the seismic response response spectrum. On the, on the vertical axis here is a graph that shows the seismic response acceleration and on the horizontal axis is the period. Now generally we have a definition of that seismic response spectrum when we're investigating a specific building and a specific site location. Um, and generally that is a 5% damped response spectrum as coordinated with ASCE 7 or ASCE 41. What we may not pay attention to as frequently would be the damping coefficient B. And the damping coefficient B that is included in the definition of the seismic response spectrum is actually a function of the damping ratio as defined by the following equation. We can see here that this equation plotted with vertical axis effective viscous damping ratio and the horizontal axis being the damping coefficient, we can see that when we typically look at a 5% damped response spectrum, the B value is one. However, when we look at a 25% damp st structure with added viscous damping, then the B value is 1.7. This gives us almost a 50% reduction in response of our structure. So if we look at adding damping via 25% damp response, we reduce the response of the structure. A quick video here will demonstrate what I'm discussing with you. The damp structure on the right versus the um damp structure on the left has reduced response and deflection and acceleration 
and demands on the structure. These type of damping can be applied to many different applications as discussed previously. For seismic retrofit applications, discus dampers are typically used in non-ductile reinforced concrete moment frames, steel and concrete moment frames with soft stories, and also pre-Northridge steel moment frames. For new construction applications, dampers are often used with steel moment frames with viscous dampers, concrete moment frames with viscous dampers, and base isolation systems with viscous dampers. Dampers can also be used in bridge construction applications, whether it be seismic vibrations, wind vibrations, traffic, pedestrian vibrations. Um, there's been a number of buildings that this, or bridges that dampers have been used to take advantage of the same fundamental principles. Here we have a picture of a bridge. I, I will not pronounce that name there, um, but, but you understand this is a bridge in Turkey that's been retrofitted with tailored devices, viscous dampers. On the bottom left is actually a bridge that's very close to me. This is the San Pedro Bridge, which is in Long Beach, California. Um, last but not least, um, viscous dampers can be used in a number of tall building construction applications. Um, dampers have been used in what are known as damped outriggers, mega braces, and also, uh, with tune mass dampers. Today, we'll spend the majority of our time discussing damping applications for non-ductile concrete moment frames. Now, non-ductile concrete moment frames are flexible concrete moment frames with insufficient detailing at beam column joints. And typically, if we consider the BSE-1X or BSE-2X, the demands are much larger than the actual drift capacity of the structure. BSE-2X demands are typically in the range of two to 3%. But the actual capacity before failure or quite honestly collapse of the structure is around one to one and a half percent. This non-ductile reinforcement detailing of the beam columns joints, the columns and the beams provides a mechanism for failure such that the concrete spalls and when the concrete spalls due to insufficient confinement of the longitudinal bars then you can get bar buckling and collapse of floor level or excessive cracking and damage, which leads to instability. Now, this has been recognized throughout the world on since as, as far back as the 1970s that there are problems with non-ductile reinforced concrete buildings. And so major earthquakes have driven cities across the world to retrofit these structures to protect improve public safety and, and protect historical structures. World Bank and other institutional funded programs help to provide funding and drive the retrofit of these older structures. I'd like to discuss retrofit applications for these types of structures. Generally, the retrofit strategy would be to reduce the ductility demands on critical components to prevent major damage or collapse, while at the same time limiting the retrofit construction costs and the interruption to business operations. Here, if we take a seismic response spectrum again, and we look at a 5% damped response spectrum and look at the period of an existing building shown here in the red, if we were to retrofit that structure by adding walls or braces, this adds stiffness and strength to the structure. But as we add stiffness and strength to the structure, this decreases the period and the accelerations and the demands on the structure will, will increase. An alternative and an efficient method for retrofitting these types of structure is to add viscous damping. When we add viscous damping to these structures, the period is not altered. And by adding viscous dampers to these structures, we can reduce the response and the demand with limited interruptions to business operations. Here's another comparison, a more detailed comparison of the classical upgrade techniques of these types of buildings versus a a retrofit technique with viscous dampers. When we look on the far left hand side of the, the screen, you can see that adding strength to a non-ductile concrete moment frame widespread throughout the building can be a method of, of upgrading these types of buildings. However, this can be very cost prohibitive, very intrusive to business operations, and sometimes will not even provide the needed performance that's required to retrofit these types of buildings. Another method would be, as discussed previously, to add a large shear wall, concrete shear wall to these, to these buildings. Now, generally, as we discussed previously, when you add a shear wall to these buildings, it's going to increase the demand on both the foundations and the diaphragms. These retrofits tend to be cost prohibitive and intrusive. 
when you're working with viscous dampers, viscous dampers can be isolated at discrete locations throughout the building and then only localized connection where dampers are connected at joints or beam connections for chevron configurations might may be required. Typically FRP or even steel jacketing can be used at these connections to protect the confinement of the steel and the intrusion of the connection from the damper to the beam and column joint. Most importantly, foundation upgrades are typically not necessary because the dampers move out of phase with the structural or, or out of phase as their velocity dependent or out of phase with the structural demands in the structure. And we'll go into that further um, later on in this discussion. Um, when looking at the cost benefits for construction, uh, it's a very non-intrusive construction process. The damper installation is simple. Um, and because the viscous dampers are efficient and reducing the response of the structure, the connection detailing is minimized. And, and, and you can really minimize uh, and retain building operations, miniaturize intrusivity to building operations to retain those building operations. As Dan, it's very simple to, uh, it's very simple to bring the dampers into the building and isolate areas of construction while the building remains operational. Um, here's a quick example of a project that was done in San Bruno, California. This was a triggered seismic retrofit of a three-story non-ductile concrete moment frame. The office building was built in the 1980s. Uh, and, and here you can see on the right-hand side, we got some nice pink dampers here. Um, they're used in isolated bays throughout the building to retrofit this structure. Um, on the bottom right-hand side is the connect, and there are the connection details for these dampers. Uh, you'll notice on the left-hand side that the actual force of the dampers is 500 kips. And so we were able to get 500 kips into the connections of these existing beams and column joints. Here, what they did to connect the gusset plates to the beams and the columns is they actually through bolted through the beam and the column. Um, and for, first they, they x-ray the beams and the columns to, to identify or locate where the existing reinforcement is. And then they through bolt through the concrete to put these bolts through and plate on both sides of the beam and column. Um, and the, actually what they do is they manufacture the uh, plates, the base plates for the beam and column after they identify the locations of the holes. Because oftentimes um, there'll be some staggered configurations where the bolts need to be. And so that's a very efficient process. You can also use uh, welded washers to provide oversized holes on the base plates. And then you can have a little bit more play when you're adjusting the location of the base plate and, and the bolts. Last but not least, the, besides the construction cost benefits um, and the allowing building operations to be retained during construction, there are some benefits to the performance or life cycle cost of the structure when using a viscous damper option versus classical retrofit options. Viscous energy dissipation as opposed to structural damage will, will actually be a much more resilient method uh, from protecting the building structure. By reducing storage drifts and floor accelerations at the same time to protect both the non-structural components and the structure, the structure itself, little to no damage will actually happen during a major se se seismic event. And such that as after a major earthquake, you can often retain building operations, um, which improves the, uh, the functional recovery of the building. So damping applications for soft, we, I'm gonna transition at this point to talk about something that's very familiar, very similar to what we just talked about with damping applications for non-ductile concrete moment frames to damping applications for non-ductile concrete soft weak story <laughs> buildings. Um, you'll see these buildings um, have, have quite frequently collapsed um, during major earthquakes as, as recently happened in Turkey, unfortunately. Um, typically at the first floor level, there's a significant story stiffness change um, and deflections actually concentrate uh, on that one story. And so combined with insufficient connection detailing and strength uh, of those columns, um, you, get, you get collapse. And it's quite an unfortunate uh, event for these buildings. Um, when you're looking at ASCE 41 uh, and you're doing a tier one check, you'll identify both weak and soft story irregularities as the ratio of the shear strengths or stiffness of the seismic force resisting system, respectively to an adjacent floor. Um, 
once you've identified that in a tier one check, um, you'll move on to the tier three checks. Uh, and so the first step will be to perform either a linear static procedure or a linear dynamic procedure. And the level shall be defined as a weak story element if the average DCR ratio of the columns is greater than the average DCR ratio of the beams, or if the average DCR ratio of the columns is greater than 1.0 or, or M over two. Um, once you've identified this in the first step, most likely you'll move to the second step, which is to perform either a nonlinear static procedure or nonlinear dynamic procedure. Um, and when you do this, you'll, you'll identify that there's column hinging at both the top and bottom of the columns and, and that there's a, a significant collapse mechanism. Um, so a classical upgrade technique for these buildings generally would be to provide a wall up the entire height of the building. Um, and this will significantly increase the uh, decrease the period of the building, excessive demands on the diaphragms and the foundations, um, and can be quite cost prohibitive. Um, when using viscous dampers for these types of retrofits, viscous dampers are only required at the first floor level. And so similar to the retrofit process that we talked about earlier, only connection detailing will be required at the connections. Uh, additional connection strengthening will be required at the connections of the dampers to the structure it, with no foundation retrofits. Um, here's an example actually of a mandatory seismic retrofit project of a 12 story non-ductile concrete moment frame with a soft story irregularity in Beverly Hills. Um, a little different, um, I, I did identify that the soft story would happen at the bottom floor uh, of these buildings, but actually at some times this soft story irregularity can happen um, at a different floor level. Here you can see on the bottom right hand side that the soft story is really at about the fourth level of this building where there's a change in geometry of the structure. Uh, these connection detailings of these dampers are very similar to the connection details that we discussed previously where they threw bolted through the beams and the columns uh, to anchor these gusset plates uh, into the existing structure. Um, another option um, as shown in this project here is a, for a voluntary seismic retrofit of a 14 story non-ductile concrete moment frame with a soft story irregularity at the bottom floor. Um, here, the, the damper force is 400 kips. Um, there were 16 dampers used to retrofit this structure. You can see on the right-hand side, there's a coffee shop and, and these dampers are here. The construction detailing is a little different here. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that the yellow um, shaded area is the existing column. And then the green shaded area is a concrete cap or extension. Uh, and then the blue area is the, the viscous damper and its connection. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see that existing column where they've, again, they've, they've x-rayed or, or, or located the existing reinforcement. They've anchored uh, reinforcement for a concrete extension into those columns and beams. And then that large metal uh, plate there is actually the gusset plate where the viscous damper will connect directly. Now, now this extension is actually provided both to the columns and the beams. So this provides, it's an innovative way to provide not just uh, viscous dampers to that bay, but also a little added strength to that bay um, with some uh, efficient connection detailing. Um, I'm gonna transition now uh, to talk a little bit more, not just about the applications of dampers, but let's talk uh, about viscous dampers themselves, the fundamentals, um, how to model them. Um, so here I have a viscous damper cutaway. Um, in this cutaway, you will see that on both end of the dampers, there is a clevis on, on one end of, of the damper. That clevis is attached to a piston rod. That piston rod has a piston head in the center. That piston head is within a chamber of fluid that's surrounded by a cylinder in red and capped on each side by the green seals. As the viscous damper strokes back and forth, the fluid is forced to flow through orifices in the piston head or around the piston head from one side of the chamber to the, other, to the other. Here, kinetic energy is absorbed and converted to heat. Again, I'll show you another video which will describe this process. Again, on each end of this device, there is a clevis. One end of the clevis is attached to a piston rod. As that piston rod strokes, the, in the chamber of fluid, the fluid is forced to pass through complex and precision or uh, manufactured orifice through the piston head or around the piston head surface. So we can control 
the force velocity relationships of these devices through the detailing of the orifices and the surfaces of the piston head. Wait for this video to stop here real quick. That's good. Um, again, I said these devices are velocity dependent devices where the output force is proportional to the velocity. Um, the velocity exponent alpha um, can be varied from 0 0.2 to two. In the graph on the right, um, I show a what we call a linear damper where alpha is one and the force and the velocity output is proportional. Um, and, and in blue, the alpha is 0 0.3, which is a standard uh, exponent that's used for seismic applications. And here, the viscous damper follows a nonlinear relationship. If we take a look at the energy dissipation provided by both linear and nonlinear dampers, uh, for a linear damper in orange here, where alpha is equal to one, the area within that ellipse of the energy dissipation um, follows a simple equation where the area is just pi times the force times the stroke of the damper. Uh, whereas when you're dealing with a nonlinear damper, it's the blue, uh, what's actually called a super ellipse here. Um, and, and that behavior is very, the energy dissipation is the same equivalent energy dissipation as the linear damper, um, but actually less force demand. Um, it's extremely important that when structural engineers uh, and contractors specify the behavior of viscous dampers, that the performance of those dampers be tested and verified. Uh, there's three key performance indicators, um, one being the force velocity behavior, two being the temperature variation of the devices, and three being the dependency uh, or the service life of those dampers. So if we look at the blue line here in the graph on the right, this would be the nominal force velocity relationship specified for the damper. Uh, when you look at the far right vertical line here, this would be the max force or velocity that this damper would be subjected to during the BSC-2X event. What Taylor devices will do is they'll test in accordance with ACE-7 and ACE-41 requirements at 100% velocity for BSC-2X, 67% of that velocity, and 33% velocities. This ensures that the damper behaves as structural engineers have modified and are expecting the devices to perform. We also will test those damping devices at varying cold and hot temperatures based on site conditions to show that based on those temperatures, that these devices will not vary between a plus or minus 15% bounds. Last but not least, we'll do a service life test, which is application dependent, depending on where the viscous damper is used. But most frequently for seismic retrofit applications, we consider a design windstorm, where we look at thousands of cycles uh, of the damper um, over a longer period of time, generally around 15 to 30 minutes that the damper might experience during a design windstorm. We have four hydraulic test stands that we use to do these tests with up to 8,000 kilonewtons output force and 2.5 meters per second velocities. We also have vertical drop testing stands with seven separate drop rails, up to 260 kilonewtons of weight, test forces up to 18,000 kilonewtons, and velocities up to 15 meters per second. Um, over the years, over the last 25 years that Taylor Devices has been manufacturing viscous dampers, we've developed a catalog of devices that structural engineers can specify and rely upon to be used in building structures and, and bridge structures. On the left-hand side here, you can see that we have, can manu we have devices that are standard catalog from force ranging from 250 kilonewtons up to 8,000 kilonewtons with stroke ranges of plus or minus 75 millimeters up to plus or minus 125 millimeters. We provide that same device uh, with the same exact uh, ranges of sizes with a end, different end configurations. Here we have a square end configuration um, that can be used to attach to an extender brace, which we'll talk about more later. We also can provide rectangular end configurations, custom device end configurations, or circular configurations. Um, when modeling viscous dampers, as I mentioned just a moment ago, oftentimes we'll put a end plate on the end of the damper and that end plate will attach to an extender brace. And that extender brace is essentially making up the rest of the diagonal in a cost efficient way. Now the viscous dampers itself is actually modeled by the Maxwell model of viscoelasticity where a 
linear spring is in series with the dash pot. And so the linear extender stiffness of that extender would just be represented by the area of steel, the modulus of elasticity and the length of that member. So if we look at the combined behavior of both a viscous damper in series with an extender brace, you get two springs in series with the dash pot. Um, so if we, we look at the catalog units that I just discussed with you, Taylor Devices has Maxwell stiffnesses for each of our units in a catalog and we can provide those to you. Uh, and so those catalog units, when you look at them, we combine both the spring in series with the extender. And so when you're using typical software programs like ETABS or SAP 2000 or even Perform, you'll want to have taken the springs of the viscous, uh, of the viscous damper and the linear extender together to make the Maxwell stiffness for the damper link unit. Uh, it's extremely important to accurately capture this Maxwell stiffness because what you'll note is that when you look at the hysteresis loops of a damper, that depending on the K value or the Maxwell stiffness of that damper, the hysteresis loops will pinch as shown here in the graph on the left. As the infinite, if K is infinitely stiff, you get a perfect E super ellipse for, without any pinching. However, as K gets softer, you get pinching of the hysteresis loops. If you look on the right-hand side here, this is, shows on the vertical axis, the energy dissipation loss versus on the horizontal axis, the Maxwell stiffness. So as you go to infinitely stiff for the Maxwell stiffness, there essentially is no energy dissipation loss. However, as K gets softer and softer, these hysteresis loops pinch more and more, and you start to get less energy dissipation than ideal. And so you want to understand when you're doing nonlinear response history analysis with viscous damper and mo take in modeling these characteristics, um, what the behavior is and to make sure that you're using the accurate Maxwell stiffness. I'd like to now take this opportunity with, oh, I have a good amount of time, about 30 minutes left to go over non-ductile concrete moment frame retrofit preliminary design process. So the preliminary design process here, um, step one would be to identify a controlling performance objective. Um, and so if you take a concrete moment frame, this is a 13 story concrete uh, moment frame, we'll consider it to be non-ductile concrete. One of our first steps to do would be to do a linear dynamic procedure. When you do a linear dynamic procedure, you'll develop moment demands on the structure and you can identify a critical moment demand on the structure, also known as QE. You could also take that same linear dynamic procedure and look at the story drifts. Here you can identify the critical story drift of that structure. As we discussed previously, the demands from a BSE2X event or 2E or 2N event on a building uh, might be up to 3%, whereas their drift capacity is actually only around 1.5%. Uh, last but not least, you can do a nonlinear static procedure um, where we can monitor the pushover curve and look at the roof displacement. Now, there's a target displacement demand that we want to identify for this structure that's in accordance with the requirements of the building code. Step two will be to determine corresponding target performance objectives or component capacities. So if we look again at the linear dynamic procedure, we can determine a target moment that based on the capacity of those beams that we'd like to get uh, use damping to reduce the demand on those beams. We can also take a target drift and that target drift would be again, a target drift that we want the structure to be retrofitted to or a target roof displacement when looking at the nonlinear static procedure. Step three would be to determine the required viscous damping to meet the target performance objectives. So here we have an equation where we can define what the target viscous damping is based on our critical demand and our target demand. And so by determining the amount of viscous damping, whether it be the nonlinear static procedure, the, non, the linear dynamic procedure for story drifts or the linear dynamic procedures for moments, we can um, determine the required amount of viscous damping. Step four would be to determine the vertical distribution of dampers in the structure. Um, generally, uh, what you might see would just be a, a stacked configuration with dampers uh, in the, the middle bay, for example, of a moment frame. 
but there are a lot of other different types of configurations that can be efficient and, and useful. Um, here's a staggered configuration. You can have an offset tower configuration um, or a checkered configuration. Um, oftentimes spreading out the dampers in a staggered offset tower or checkered configuration is going to reduce demands on the columns and the foundations. Step five would be to use stiffness proportional damping to determine the linear properties of the dampers based on the target viscous damping ratio determined in step three. Um, the equation on the right determines the damper con linear damper constant for a damper on uh, a specific damper J on, on the eighth floor level. And so that's based on the T, the fundamental period in the direction of interest, K being the floor stiffness at that level, the number of dampers on that level, and then the angle of the dampers uh, or that specific damper um, at that level. Um, step six, we, we actually, because we talked about previously when, when we're using seismic retrofit, we're often specifying nonlinear dampers. And so we'll use equivalent energy dissipation to determine nonlinear damper properties. Here, we need to have an estimate of the actual velocity of the device during the seismic event to determine to use equivalent energy dissipation as discussed previously. And so we can approximate that velocity by just using two pi over T, which is here, uh, multiplied by the stroke of the damper, omega times displacement is equal to velocity. And you would determine that displacement either by the linear dynamic procedure or, or a nonlinear static procedure. And again, we'll use equivalent energy dissipation to determine the nonlinear damper properties on the left-hand side. So we're essentially just switching from the orange loop here um, to, the, to the blue loop from an orange, which is alpha is the uh, equal to one is a linear damper and alpha is equal to 0 0.3 is a nonlinear damper. And the last step of the process is once we've determined the C values of the dampers, um, we can calculate the forces uh, in the dampers. And once we've calculated the forces in the dampers based on the velocity, we can actually do a check the existing comp building components for demands from the dampers. So we'll check the columns, we'll check the beams, we'll check the foundations. And what typically what we'll, we'll find is that the damper demands on the columns and beams and foundations are less than what would be required for additional retrofit. This, the, now I'm going to transition again, just like we did previously from non-ductile concrete moment frames to soft weak story non-ductile concrete retrofits. Um, very similar process, but the behavior of these structures is different. Um, and I'm going to present a kind of a, an advanced method for determining the optimal damper properties um, for these types of structures. So similar as, as discussed previously, we identify the controlling performance objective moment demands, in this case, would most likely be on the columns of a first floor level for a soft story. Um, the drifts, we're oftentimes going to have really high drifts at the first level. Um, and, or again, you can do a nonlinear static procedure to determine the demand from the target displacement. Um, we'll determine what our corresponding target performance objective is based on what the capacity of the structure is, whether or not that be uh, a drift level in the structure of one and a half percent at the bottom floor, um, you know, dividing the target displacement at the roof by, by 50 percent or reducing the column demands uh, at the base of the structure so that they do not yield and, and uh, provide a collapse mechanism. Um, step three will be to determine the required viscous damping to meet those target performance objectives. Same, same step as done previously here. Um, where the viscous damp the required viscous damping can be determined just by looking at the critical demand versus our target uh, our target demand. Um, now, we can use a, a simplified single mode behavior to determine the linear damper properties when providing dampers for a soft weak story retrofit. Again, um, when you're working with these types of structures, only dampers dampers are only going to be required at the first level, um, and so we will actually take the equation on the right, which is the target viscous damping ratio, the period in the direction of interest, and then the full seismic building mass um, will be used to determine the damper properties on that level. Um, again, the angle of the dampers is also important. Um, 
this is a, a very, um, it's an approximate solution. And depending if the structure is three or, or maybe 10 stories tall, um, there can be some variability in its accurateness. And so we always want to be cautious when using damping on only one level. Um, when you put dampers throughout the height of the building via stiffness proportional damping, um, you get a really reliable performance objective. When you're using dampers on just one level, you really want to understand the behavior of the structure um, and what the optimal damper properties are. And so we've added an additional step when you're considering soft weak stories and providing dampers only on the first level. Um, we can use frequency analysis to optimize linear damper properties and, and, and understand the damp structure behavior. Um, so on the left-hand side of the screen, what you'll do to do this frequency analysis is, is you'll generate um, several time history functions. Um, I use a sine function, and that sine function has a period that uh, bounds from um, well below the fundamental frequency of the structure to above the fundamental frequency of the structure. Then what I'll do is I'll take a modal load pattern, and that modal load pattern for the first mode um, will be varied with those time history functions. Um, then we'll consider several different damper constants bounded by the damper constants that we determined in step four, both lower and upper. And in the end, what we can have is the frequency response analysis shown on the right side here, uh, or the right side of the slide here, um, where we can really understand the behavior of the structure and the characteristics with respect to adding different values of C to the dampers. And so the next, the next plots that I'll show you here will um, help us to understand that better. So what I have here um, are some sample plots um, of story drift versus the period of loading, damper force versus the period of loading, and base shear versus the period of loading. And what I've done is I've taken a structure and I, I evaluated that structure based on those time history functions discussed in the previous slide. Um, and then I've increased the C value from zero, meaning non-damped, all the way to a very high value of C. And so what you'll see here, if we start on the left-hand side of the screen and we look at just story drift, is that as you would expect, in this case, our natural period is we're going to be where we have the highest resonance or the peak in response of the structure. So in this case, our natural period, it's hard to see in, in the graph there, but it's actually a period of 1.2 seconds. And so as I increase the damper constant, the, drew for, the drift, the story drift reduces. And that's what we'd expect. We add damping, this reduces the response of the structure and we reduce the drift in the structure. However, I do want you to take note of one thing here. Now the C value is varied here from C is equal to zero, um, and the damper constant legend here, all the way up to C is equal to 1,000. When you get to very high values of C, if the damper constant is too high, the drifts start to increase at a higher frequency of loading. And so something is happening there, and it's actually best described in the damper force versus period of loading plot. Here, if we look at Again, in black there, in the vertical dashed line, is the natural frequency or the, the fundamental period of the structure. As we increase the C value of the damper, the damper force goes up. And that damper force goes up corresponding to the natural period or the fundamental frequency of the structure. However, at a certain value of C, the dampers begin to act more like braces and the structure become rigidized structure becomes rigidized. And what this does is it essentially alters the frequency of the structure, similar to if you put a brace at that first floor level and the structure is much stiffer. And so the frequency is actually lowered all the way down to 0 0.5 seconds. And that's where we get the peak response in the dampers. And so the trick when using dampers on the first floor level for a soft story weak retrofit is actually to kind of look, it is actually best represented on the right figure here where we look at base shear versus period of loading and we look at base shear versus period of loading there's there's an optimal damper constant to keep the structure from rigidizing reduce the drift and limit the damper demands and so if we consider all three of these plus we want to find that optimal c value so that we don't rigidize the structure but we also get the drift reduction that we want um,
And once we've determined that linear damper constant or C value, we'll go through the exact same process that we discussed earlier, where we use equivalent energy dissipation to determine the nonlinear damper properties. Um, and then finally in step seven, um, this one's a little simpler when we're checking existing building components for damper demands. Here I'm showing a Chevron configuration, but if dampers are just at the first floor level, we really only need to evaluate the connections of the dampers uh, to, the, to the base or the foundation of the structure and to that first floor beam or, or column level. Um, and again, the damper load effects from the dampers are just simply calculated from the nonlinear damper coefficient, considering the upper bound um, damper constant factor that we talked about previously due to temperature effects. Um, so this has been a lot of technical information and I realized that it can be a lot to digest. And so Taylor Devices um, provides extensive support to structural engineers and contractors looking to work with our devices. Um, an example of that would, would be our support and in, in, as engineers uh, develop construction drawings. Um, when we talked about previously, this Taylor devices will provide the viscous damper here um, and will also provide uh, connection detailing um, configurations that structural engineers can use for their specific project. Now, um, it's also important to be able to install these in building structures. Next, I'll kind of end off on a, a cool video that'll show you guys a quick uh, example of how these dampers would be installed in a building. Um, and so we, we have uh, extensive support that we provide during the construction process to, to show how uh, contractors can, can install our devices. It's a pretty cool video here. Um, so the damper is actually uh, slid into the gusset plate connection here where the spacers are provided uh, and then a, the pin goes through the end of the clevis. Um, and then the, we went through very quickly there, but the gusset plate uh, is extended on the other end in the same mechanism. Um, so that, that's the end of my presentation. Again, I, I wanna thank uh, Mehmet for, and Tassi for, for having me present today. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Nathan Canny, who's our senior project manager and Conrad Erickson for their support in developing this presentation. Um, last but not least, we have a damper design manual as shown over here on the right that has, you know, 300, I think it's 300 pages long um, that we can provide to you that'll provide uh, a summary uh, of all the information uh, at, a, at a high level of detail that I've shown you today. So again, I wanna thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And, uh, and that's the, the end. Um, if, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Uh, well, we also thank you, Mr. Aaron Malatesta. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, take some time for questions now. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your control panel in TASI YouTube channel. It looks like we have some questions I would like to read. Uh, so uh, uh, for example, Tunç Deniz Uludağ. Hello everyone. When you say it's uh, five to twenty-five percent in the beginning, is twenty-five a combined value for inherent damping and viscous damping energy dissipation, or else are they accounted separately? That's a that's a really good question. Um, so, in that equation that I had shown previously, uh, the effective viscous damping ratio was just twenty-five percent, which would be a combined inherent damping plus viscous damping. Um, depending on what the structural engineer would like to select for the inherent damping, you'll, you'll add the inherent damping to the viscous damping. Generally, I'll, I'll actually see when considering nonlinear analyses that, that engineers will use either two or two and a half or, or even up to 3% inherent damping. And then we can calculate the, the viscous damping reduction. Hopefully that, that answers their question. Okay, one comment from Doru Uchak. I watched those Bo Bo Boazici, Bosphorus bridge tampers in action at Taylor Devices Buffalo facility. It yeah. was so nice to see them here again. And also uh, from one architect, Miss Hilal Yunay, uh, he, she asks a question. In addition to being very effective, there is a visual limitation when energy absorbers are used in facade frames. Could you tell us what other effects these systems have on uh, architectural design? 
That's a good question. Um, I, I'm, you know, it, it's funny. I, I'm definitely a structural engineer, and I'm not an architect. So, uh, yes. um, I'm, I'm uh, sure <laughs> probably she's probably used to dealing with people like me um, and and talking about the effects. Um, so, when using viscous dampers uh, in these types of structures, uh, there is a visual effect. Um, it's similar to looking at any other types of braces. Um, I think that actually, you know what I would say. If I was an architect and I wanted to look at damper configurations and understand the visual effects, I'd probably go here. I'd probably be, be really interested in looking at the different vertical configurations throughout the building. Um, and if you have these taller buildings, um, you can really provide some uh, unique configurations uh, for those viscous dampers in the buildings. Uh, I didn't show a picture here and I certainly uh, will do that next time. Um, there's some other types of configurations that um, can also be used that have some nice uh, visual effects. That, that's, that's my answer for an architect. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, also, Bayram Aydin, uh, I know him. He is interested on uh, retrofitting the buildings, existing buildings. He says, a great presentation. I wonder if Aaron could tell a little bit more strengthening on strengthening of connections where damper is attached to nine ductile beam column joints using FRP, you know, FRP, or steel yeah. plates. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good question. I didn't show a figure and I'll, and I'll certainly do that next time. That, that has been something that's been done um, where, where you can actually FRP uh, the, the column or the beams where the dampers are connecting to. Um, and in that case, you won't need to through bolt all the way through the beamer column to attach a plate on the other side. Um, you can you can actually just use like a Hilti epoxy or sorry, I just called out a vendor. You can use an epoxy anchor rod <laughs> to connect to uh, to the beamer, the column. I don't have a detail of that to show um, right now. Actually, you know what? I can pull it up. We're on the screen here. Concrete details. So that, that's what he's talking about there. Um, so this would be a column. And so in that column, um, the dash lines here are FRP. Um, and so then you would just uh, epoxy anchor rod into the, the column. And so here's another picture of that here where we have an existing column. And so we would FRP around the column and attach the epoxy anchor rods. Yeah, FRP is definitely... Um, is definitely a, a friend to, to viscous dampers. When, when, when you want to retrofit a non-ductile concrete uh, moment frame or soft story structure, um, you can get you know, a little added um, capacity out of the structure by adding FRP, um, and then you can reduce the demand by, by adding dampers. So, so they definitely wow. work together well to, to retrofit these types of structures. Interesting. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Tunç Deniz Uludağ. As viscous dampers are innovative seismic resisting systems, how did you determine seismic performance factors such as R, C, D, and over strength values for a new or existing structure? That's a good question. Um... How much time do we have? <laughs> I oh, can okay. talk about yeah, that for a yeah, while. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Um, what's a good Take way to, yeah, what's a good way to answer that? I, I wouldn't necessarily talk about, um, R, you know, or CD or, or overstrength factors for seismic retrofit buildings. I talk about them in new construction. Um, and if you're talking about them in new construction, um, there's some very prescriptive methods to be able to do that. Um, generally, um, there's a process to, to kind of work with there. Um, you'll design a, a structure for the required um, R factor from the building code based on the primary seismic force resisting system. And then you can actually consider a 25% reduction in the, in the, in the base year, the, the, the okay. minimum design base year. Um, that's definitely a discussion for another time. And I, I probably could provide another hour long presentation just on just on that. So I'll save that for another TASI presentation, potentially. <laughs> uh, also, another question from, again, Tunç Deniz Uludağ. If you followed FEMA P695, uh, 
instructions, did you utilize 5% equivalent viscous damping to model inherent damping in elastic response? That's a good question. Um, I'm not an expert in FEMA P695. Um, I am familiar with it. Um, generally, I do not, I actually don't know. I do not, in, as required with the building code for chapter 16 of ACE 7 um, or the nonlinear dynamic procedure for an AC 41, you would actually consider in the range of two to 3% inherent damping for the structure for nonlinear response history analyses. I don't expect that P695 would provide 5%, but it's possible. It definitely could. I, so I, 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 would, I do not know that. Okay. Uh, Shukru Mert Dizer asks, hello and good evening to everybody. I would like to thank uh, Tasi uh, and Mr. Aaron Malatesta for this event. In Turkey, I have seen many examples of base isolated systems. However, viscous damper systems are not familiar, but they are quite interesting. I would like to ask kindly to Mr. Aaron Malatesta if he could share his presentation. Yeah, I think that's something like that can certainly be arranged. Because I got uh, same request from other people also uh, about your presentation. Yeah, uh, many absolutely. Many people requested. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also Carlos Alfonso. Hi, Aaron. Uh, this is Wilson from DR. Excellent presentation. Regards. Oh. Hey, DR. Wilson. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> and Mustafa Görkem Yıldız. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the nice presentation. Where can we download uh, Taylor's Damper Design Menu? That's a, we'll, we'll provide a link. How about that following this presentation? I wish I had a link. Uh, or maybe we can put it, this is going up on YouTube, correct? No, uh, okay. okay. Yeah, we can put a link in the description on YouTube so that people can potentially go through the link in okay. the description. Good, nice. Or maybe you can, after the, maybe now okay. you can write uh, on the chat panel. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, no, no, no problem. Nobody can uh, miss it. And also yes. from Italy, Dr. Alessandro Martelli, he says, uh, excellent presentation again. Uh, welcome, Martelli, Dr. Martelli. Also, GC, GC Valencia, in a seismic loss assessment context, can you say the building owner is losing money? One building is a conventional design compared to a seismic protected building. Can you can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, uh, in a seismic loss assessment context, can you say that building owner is losing money when building is a conventional design compared to seismically protected building? Yeah, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I'll, I'll try uh, to answer. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, maybe, I, I'll say I'll say this when you, when you're considering the um, life cycle costs of a building, if you do not retrofit a building that um, could be damaged, you're um, liable for for that damage. Um, mm -hmm. But then, if you're going to retrofit that building and you retrofit it with conventional methods, those conventional methods they're going to protect the building from collapse. Mm -hmm. but the building will still be significantly damaged. Uh, right. Where if you're going to spend that money. You might as well spend that money using dampers, which will not only protect the building from collapse, but also from damage. So that after the earthquake, that building could repay operations and you could actually save yourself a lot of money. So it's, it's a really, uh, and insurance companies will take that into consideration when you're getting uh, policies. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Yes, thank you. And uh, with Zuan Ali, hi everyone. Thanks for your knowledge sharing. When the movement increasing, sometimes frequency can be decreasing in this situation, and damping ratio follow the same uh, decrease. I think uh, my question, he says, uh, reasonably, the damping forces and energy dissipation increased opposite damping. Ratio was decreased. What do you think? One more time. Uh, okay, uh, the damping forces and energy dissipation increased. Opposite yeah. damping ratio was decreased. What do you think? 
Um, I, I, you know what? It sounds like a great question to ask me um, on a, at another time. So you feel free to contact me after the meeting and I'd be happy okay. to discuss okay. this, this further. Mm -hmm. And also Bahadur Shadan, uh, are the viscous dampers affected by the high and low, low ambient temperature? That, they are so that in, maybe I didn't do a, a, a good enough job uh, presenting that today. It's certainly something that uh, I could probably spend a, uh, an hour going over testing and behaviors of dampers. Um, but but so the the high and low temperatures are bounded by a plus or minus fifteen percent um, on the nominal behavior. Generally, actually, the temperature effects um, are not more than a plus or minus five, maybe up to plus or minus ten percent. Um, depending on the, the application, but, uh, and so there's some other tolerances built into that plus or minus 15%. They're highly reliable, um, under both hot and cold temperatures. For example, as far as I know, for Bosphorus bridge, it was, uh, around, uh, plus minus 15%. Yeah, for correct. Bosphorus bridge. Uh, also Bahadur Shadan, could you please also share information about, uh, the lifelong maintenance of the dampers? Oh, that, that's great. Yeah. So, so our devices are, you know, maintenance free. We provide a warranty for 35 years. Um, they are manufactured with high strength seals um, that are energized by, by fluid pressure. Um, and so those devices do not need to be maintained over the life of the building. Um, okay. Uh, also uh, from Iran, maybe Farzat Hejazi. Thanks for very interesting presentation. How to fit in capacity chore to the target displacement? I mean, how to get beta V equation in step three? Step three, I love it. So let's go down to the details of it. Step three, how to get this beta V equation. Yeah, I developed this one. Um, and it's, it's simply just a rearrangement of the equation that is in ASCE 41. So, um, if we look at the very beginning, I said that the response spectrum is uh, affected by the damping uh, coefficient. And so if you look at the damping coefficient, it's this equation here. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why it looks a little bit, so taking the inverse of a natural log. So if you look at this equation here, and then you go back down to step three. That, that's how I developed this equation here. Here, and, and it makes sense. I, I can derive that on another time, how I derived okay. this equation. Okay. But that's basically the, the damping uh, coefficient is just a scalar reduction. So therefore I can estimate the amount of viscous damping required by this equation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Arkan Yuan asks, what is the ceiling warranty? How long is the service life of the dampers? Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's a good question. So, so our damper for seismic retrofit applications can handle thousands and thousands of cycles. Um, we provide a 50 year design life and most specifications mm -hmm. is what's required. 50 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's been other applications where we've done, you know, more. Um, and that's something that we've, you know, discussed, but 50 years is a good number. Uh, again, uh, Abu Bakr Abdinur, doctor, uh, I am just wondering if you could share this slide. Uh, okay, the same question. Murat Çelik, thank you for the presentation. Can Aaron give us some estimate about the price of the dampers from their standard catalog? That's a good question. Um, I'm going to um, ask that that person contact us and, and we'd be happy to provide more information um, for that. Generally, when we look at these types of projects, compared to the cost of these buildings, um, we are fractions of a percentage of, of, of the cost of these buildings versus the, the cost of the dampers. And so the, it's a highly cost efficient mechanism for retrofit. I don't, I don't want to say cost right now because I'm, I'm probably not the best person to go to for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Umit Özkan, good evening. As well, as we all know, damping is velocity dependent. In case of pulse type earthquake with high and varying frequency content, a high initial force uh, 
will be expected on the structure just before the dampers are activated. How do you deal with this or just design the structure according to that initial demand? That's a good question. Um, so the great thing about viscous dampers is that they, unlike a brace um, or some type of friction element, um, they begin damping the moment that there's any vibration. So it's not amplitude dependent on whether or not it's provided. So they're providing damping the second that there's a vibration. Um, and so I think that that's really my answer to this question that there's, when you design the, the damping device, um, you know, you can follow, um, yeah, just the general rules that I provided. Um, it might be a better question to ask me at another time. And, and, and sometimes I find that maybe there's a specific application that that person is looking at. And I, we have to investigate that specific application to, to understand the behavior. And so I, okay. I apologize if that didn't directly answer their question, but I, I certainly would be happy to help them uh, after this call with that. Uh, also from Italy, Dr. Alessandro Martelli uh, has some comment. Thank you, Mehmet. We have some applications of viscous dampers in Italy for the traffic of schools and other buildings too. I also propose them, I think to you, as a consultant for the ITER, Nuclear Energy Plant, to protect its emergency chillers uh, together with vertical guides, which had vertical problems. Uh, ITER is base isolated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is the, I think, end of the questions. Uh, yes, I think, uh, thank you very much for the interesting and nice presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. We will continue webinar series. Therefore, please follow our social media accounts for our next webinars. Thanks again for joining us today, and we will see you next time. Next week, uh, our uh, speaker will be Assisi President, uh, Dr. Paolo Clemente. The subject will be seismic isolation in Italy. Uh, good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night, everybody. <clears throat>